National Public Radio, in association with Independent Radio Drama Productions, presents one of the cases of Sherlock Holmes with Edward Petherbridge as Sherlock Holmes and David Peart as Dr. John H. Watson. This is Episode 1 of The Greek Interpreter. This story first appeared in the September 1893 issue of The Strand magazine. It was the 22nd Sherlock Holmes short story to be published. The previous tales had presented a great deal about the habits and methods of Sherlock Holmes, but very little regarding his personal life. The Greek interpreter makes up for that with a really dramatic revelation, which I won't spoil by telling you. Also in this episode, we're introduced to the Diogenes Club, which Holmes describes as the queerest club in London. Well, there was no Diogenes Club in the real London of 1888, but several of those who study these things have concluded that Arthur Conan Doyle was referring to the Athenaeum Club, which did exist. A pundit wrote this about that institution. There's first the Athenaeum Club, so wise there's not a man of it that has not sense enough for six. In fact, that is the plan of it. The very waiters answer you with eloquence Socratical, and always place the knives and forks in order mathematical. So... It's off to Baker Street, where the good Dr. Watson is musing on the early life of Sherlock Holmes. Here's episode one of The Greek Interpreter, featuring Edward Petherbridge as the Master Detective. long and intimate acquaintance with Sherlock Holmes. I had never heard him refer to his relations, and hardly ever to his early life. This reticence had increased the somewhat inhuman effect which he produced upon me, until I found myself regarding him as an isolated phenomenon, a brain without a heart, as deficient in human sympathy as he was preeminent in intelligence. I had even come to believe he was an orphan with no relatives living. But one day, to my very great surprise, he began to talk to me about his brother. It was after tea on a summer evening, and the conversation, which had roamed in a desultory, spasmodic fashion from golf clubs to the obliquity of the ecliptic, came round at last to the question of atavism and hereditary aptitudes. The point under discussion was how far any singular gift in an individual was due to ancestry and how far to his early training. In your own case, from all you have told me, it seems obvious that your faculty of observation and your peculiar facility for deduction are due to your own systematic training. To some extent. My ancestors were country squires who appear to have led much the same life as is natural to their class. But I know that my talent, my art, if you like, is in the blood. It may have come from my grandmother, who was the sister of Vernet, the French artist. Such art is liable to take the strangest forms. But how do you know that it is hereditary? Because my brother, Mycroft, possesses it in a larger degree than I do. Your brother? My dear Holmes, I had no idea. I'm astonished. Is there another man with such singular powers, which you say are superior to yours? I can only conclude that you are displaying an extraordinary modesty in placing your brother's abilities above your own. My dear Watson, I cannot agree with those who rank modesty among the virtues. To the logician, all things should be seen exactly as they are, and to underestimate one's powers is as much a departure from truth as to exaggerate them. When I say, therefore, that Mycroft has better powers of observation than I. You may take it, but I am speaking the exact and literal truth. Oh. Is he your junior? Uh, seven years my senior. How comes it that he is unknown? Oh, he's not unknown. He's very well known. <laughs> in his own circle. Ah, uh, uh, where then? Well, in the Diogenes Club, for example. Diogenes Club? Yes. It is 
uh, the queerest club in London. And Mycroft, one of the queerest men, he's always there from quarter to five to twenty to eight. It's six now, so if you care for a stroll this beautiful evening, I shall be very happy to introduce you to uh, two curiosities. You may wonder why it is that Mycroft does not use his powers for detective work. He is incapable of this. Oh, but I thought you said... I said that he was my superior in observation and deduction. If the art of the detective began and ended in reasoning from an armchair, my brother would be the greatest criminal agent that ever lived. Oh. But he has no ambition and no energy. He would not even go out of his way to verify his own solutions and would rather be considered wrong than take the trouble to prove himself right. Again and again, I have taken a problem to him and have received an explanation which has afterwards proved to be the correct one. And yet, he was absolutely incapable of working out the practical points which must be gone into before a case could be laid before a judge or a jury. Uh, it is not his profession, then. I don't know. <laughs> what is to me a means of livelihood is to him the merest hobby of a dilettante. He has an extraordinary faculty for figures and audits the books in some of the government departments. He lodges in Pall Mall, and he walks around the corner into Whitehall every morning and back every evening. From year's end to year's end, he takes no other exercise. And is seen nowhere else except in the Diogenes Club, which is just opposite his room. I cannot recall the name. Hmm? Diogenes. <laughs> Very likely not. There are many men in London, you know, who, some from China, some from misanthropy, have no wish for the company of their fellows. Yet they are not averse to comfortable chairs and the latest periodical. <laughs> it is for the convenience of these that the Diogenes Club was started. And it now contains the most unsociable and unclubbable men in town. No member is permitted to take the least notice of any other one. Save in the stranger's room, no talking is under any circumstances permitted. And three offences against this rule, if brought to the notice of the committee, render the talker liable to expulsion. <laughs> My brother was one of the founders. And I have myself found it a very soothing atmosphere. Now, here we are, Watson. Now, not a word. I will conduct you to the stranger's room. We'll wait there. I will bring my Holmes took me through a dark oak-panelled hall, and we passed a large and luxurious room in which a considerable number of men were sitting about and reading papers, each in his own little nook. We walked on down a narrow corridor painted a delicate shade of green, until we reached a small chamber which looked out onto Pall Mall. I had hardly a moment to take in the pleasant view before Holmes returned with a companion who I knew could only be his brother. Mycroft Holmes was a much larger and stouter man than Sherlock. His body was absolutely corpulent, but his face, though massive, had preserved something of the sharpness of expression which was so remarkable in that of his brother. Glad to meet you, sir. Uh, uh, sir. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became his chronicler. <laughs> By the way, Sherlock, I expected to see you round last week to consult me over the Manor House case. I thought you might be a little out of your depth. No, I solved it. It was Adams, of course. Yes, it was Adams. I was sure of it from the first. Come, Dr. Watson, it is... We'll all sit down over here. Oh, we can look down into Pall Mall. <coughs> you, you see all the world pass by you. If anyone who wishes to study mankind, this is the spot. Oh, look. Look at the magnificent types. <laughs> These two men coming towards us, for example. The billiard maker and the other. Precisely. What do you make of the other? An old soldier, I perceive. And very recently discharged. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Served in India, I see. And a non-commissioned officer. Well, artillery, I fancy. 
Mm. And a widower. But with a child. Children, my dear boy. Children. Come, gentlemen, this is a little too much. Surely it is not hard to say that a man with that bearing expression of authority and sun-baked skin as a soldier is more than a private and is not long from India. That he has not left the service long is shown by his still wearing his ammunition boots, as they are called. He has not the cavalry stride, yet he wore his hat on one side, as is shown by the lighter skin on that side of his brow. His weight is against his being a sapper. He is in the artillery. Then, of course, his uh, complete mourning shows that he has lost someone very dear. The fact that he's doing his own shopping looks as though it were his wife. He has been buying things for the children, you perceive. There's a rattle which shows that uh, one of them is very young. The wife probably died in childbirth. Um, the fact that he has a picture book under his arm shows that there is another child to be thought of. Um, snuff, uh, Watson? Oh, no, thank you. This is marvelous. Uh, now I can see how the art runs in the family. <laughs> yeah, by the way, Sherlock, <clears throat> I've been... Um, I've had something quite after your own heart, a most singular problem submitted to my judgment. I really had not the energy to follow it up, save in a very incomplete fashion, but it gave me the basis for some very pleasing speculations, if uh, you care to hear the facts. My dear Mycroft, I should be delighted. Mm -hmm. Very well. I shall... Uh... Could you uh, ring the bell uh, over there, uh, Dr. Watson? Uh, yes, of course. Send a note to... Mr. Melass, and I shall ask him to join us. Ah, uh, Peter, quick as you can, run across, give this note to Mr. Melass. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, he will not be long. Mr. Melass lodges on the floor above me, and I have some slight acquaintance with him, which uh, led him to come to me. His perplexity. He is a Greek by extraction, as I understand. And he is a remarkable linguist. He earns his living partly as interpreter in the law course and partly by acting as guide to any wealthy Orientals who may visit the Northumberland Avenue hotels. Uh, I think I will leave him to tell his own very remarkable experience in his own fashion, for here he comes. Uh, ah, Mr. Holmes, thank you for your note. Uh, what is to be done? Uh, Mr. Miller, so let me introduce you to my brother, Sherlock Holmes, and his companion, uh, Dr. Watson. Mr. Millat? Mr. Millat. Oh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I am so honored to take an interest in my case. Your brother is so kind. Uh, tell your story, Mr. Millat. Do not leave uh, out the slightest detail, shall we? Sit down. Oh, Mr. Holmes. The police do not credit me. On my word, they do not. Just because they have never heard of it before, they think that such a thing cannot be. But I know that I shall never be easy in my mind until I know what has become of my poor man with the sticking plaster upon his face. I am all attention. This is Wednesday evening. Well, then, it was on Monday night, only two days ago, you understand, that all this happened. I am an interpreter. As perhaps my neighbor there has told you, I interpret all languages, or nearly all. But as I am a Greek by birth and with a Grecian name, it is with that particular tongue that I am particularly associated it happens not infrequently that I am sent for at strange hours by foreigners who get into difficulties. I was not surprised, therefore, on Monday night when a Mr. Latimer, a very fashionably dressed young man, came up to my rooms and asked me to accompany him in a cab. I'm very grateful, Mr. Malas. The fact is, a friend of mine, a Greek friend who speaks not one word of English, has just arrived from Plymouth. He's here on business, and so we're in desperate need of a translator. I see. Uh, I am, of course, happy to be of service. Uh, where is your friend staying? He's staying with me, in Kensington. Now, if you're ready, Mr. Malas, let's be off. Latimer, uh, I am a little worried. We have just traveled up Shaftesbury Avenue and are now turning into Oxford Street. Is this not a very long and roundabout way to get to Kensington? Uh, I, I think you should speak to your driver. Don't trouble yourself with routes, Mr. Millas. In fact, 
I think it's time to cut off your view, if you don't mind. But, but Mr. Latimer, why are the windows blocked out? I can see nothing at all. Sit back in your seat, Mr. Millas. That's better. The fact is that I have no intention that you should see the place to which we are driving. It might possibly be inconvenient to me if you could find your way here again. But this is very extraordinary conduct, Mr. Latimer. You must surely be aware that what you are doing is quite illegal. It is somewhat of a liberty, no doubt, but we'll make it up to you. I must warn you, however, Mr. Molas, that if at any time tonight you attempt to raise an alarm or do anything which is against my interest, you will find it a very serious thing. I beg you to remember that no one knows where you are, and that whether you are in this carriage or in my house, you are equally in my power. Mr. Malas, if you would be so good as to get out. Well, of course. Ah, Harold. Is this Mr. Malas? Yes. <laughs> well done, well done. No ill will, Mr. Malas, I hope. But we couldn't get on without you. If you deal fair with us, you'll not regret it. But if you try the tricks... God help you. Uh, what do you want with me? <laughs> Only to ask a few questions of a Greek gentleman who's visiting us. And to let us have the answers. But say no more than you're told to say, or you had better never have been born. <laughs> now, if you'd be so good as to follow me... He opened the door and showed the way into a room which appeared to be very richly furnished. But, but it was difficult to see clearly as the light was afforded by a single lamp half turned down. The chamber was certainly large and the way my feet sank into the carpet as I stepped across it told me of its richness. I caught glimpses of velvet chairs, a high white marble mantelpiece and what seemed to be a suit of Japanese armor at one side of it. There was a chair just under the lamp and I was motioned to sit in it. Latimer had left us, but he now suddenly returned, leading with him a gentleman clad in some sort of loose dressing gown who moved slowly towards us. As he came into the circle of dim light, I was thrilled with horror at his appearance. He was deadly pale and terribly emaciated, with the protruding, brilliant eyes of a man whose spirit is greater than his strength. But what shocked me more than any signs of physical weakness was that his face was grotesquely crisscrossed with sticking plaster and that one large pad of it was fastened over his mouth. Take off the plaster, Harold. Yes, of course. I stood the Tell him to keep quiet, Mr. Melas. Please. I've been a mini <laughs> Good. Now you're to ask him the questions, Mr. Melas, and you will tell me his answers. Ask him, first of all, whether he's prepared to sign the papers. He said the most nipograps to her. What did he say? He says never. I see. Well, <laughs> let's ask another question. Does he have any condition? He's got his orus. Mono antizona pantreve de brostam. Apoenagnostomu elina irea. He says... Only if I see her married in my presence by a Greek priest whom I know. <laughs> Ask him if he knows what awaits him if he doesn't give his consent. Xeris is a very many and then those is still sin catathesisu. He says that he cares nothing for himself. Damn him. Can't you persuade him, Mr. Mellor? Tell him that as soon as he signs, he can see her. <laughs> conversation lasted some time and was completely circular. I kept asking him to sign and he kept refusing and refusing with a passion. 
it was then that I hit upon a happy thought. I took to adding on little sentences of my own to each question, in the hope of finding out a little more of him. The questions and answers ran like this. Δεν θα σου φέρει τίποτα καλό αυτό το πείσμα. You can do no good by this obstinacy. Who are you? I cannot. I'm a stranger in London. Your fate will be on your own head. How long have you been here? Let it be so. Three weeks. We went on in this way, and I managed to glean that his name is Gratidis. He is from Athens. That he had no idea where he was, and that his captors were starving him. Another five minutes, Mr. Holmes, and I should have wormed out the whole story under their very noses. But at that instant, a door opened and a woman stepped into the room. I could not see her clearly enough, but she was tall and graceful, with, I think, black hair, and clad in some sort of loose white gown. She cried out when she saw the prisoner and rushed towards him. She cried his name again and again, Paul, Paul, and the man screamed... Time on the conclusion of the Greek interpreter, Mr. Melos receives a fee for his services and a threat to his life. We should not have troubled you. Only our friend who speaks Greek and who began these negotiations has been forced to return to the East. It was quite necessary for us to find someone to take his place, and we were fortunate in hearing of your powers. Ah, uh, I'm glad to be of service. <laughs> There are five sovereigns here, which will, I hope, be a sufficient fee. But remember, if you speak to a human soul about this, one human soul, mind, well, may God have mercy on your soul. Then Mycroft Holmes takes out a personal ad. Anybody supplying any information as to the whereabouts of a Greek gentleman named Paul Cretides from Athens, who is unable to speak English will be rewarded. Uh, a similar reward paid to anyone giving information about a Greek lady whose first name is Sophie. And Sherlock Holmes picks up a dangerous trail. You see that we hold all the cards, and we have only to fear some sudden violence on their part. If they give us time, we must have them. That's next time on the final episode of Arthur Conan Doyle's The Greek Interpreter. Adapted for radio and directed by Richard Shannon. Edward Petherbridge played Sherlock and Mycroft Holmes with David Peart as Dr. Watson. Other cast members were Neville Watchers, John Yannon, George Savides, and Alec Lindstedt. Music was performed by Robert Gibbs, sound design by Tim Crook. Support for this program comes from National Public Radio member stations and NPR.